Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today we welcome Lad and Zoe Wallen, fourth generation Idaho potato farmers with a passion for regenerative agriculture and sustainable practices. Lad, along with his wife Zoe, returned to their roots in 2015 to start their own farm, growing potatoes, wheat, and alfalfa. They took their love for farming a step further by founding Roots Potato Chips, a company dedicated to creating healthier snacks while positively impacting consumers the community, and the soil. Lad and Zoe share their unique perspective on regenerative agriculture, recognizing the importance of context in farming. We'll explore their approach and their focus on diversity in soil health and how it has transformed their operation. So let's get started. Well, welcome everyone to this episode of the Ag Emerge podcast. Today, I'm joined by two entrepreneur farmers who are doing regenerative agriculture and taking it all the way to the consumer. Zoe and Lad Wallen, welcome. Glad you could be here. Hi, we're so excited to be here today. And you notice, notice Lad, I introduced her first. So you always want the boss uh, introduced first, right? She's the pretty face. I'm just the behind the scenes guy. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess in the podcast, I'm the pretty face. So that says something. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we need to up our game a little bit. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. I, first thing I love to do is just Tell us your story. You're you're up in American Falls, Idaho, uh, and uh, home of the Spud. And uh, tell us tell us your your family uh, story and and how you got to where you are today. You bet. So we are fourth generation Idaho potato farmers. So pretty exciting there. We love it. We love what we do. We have a passion for what we do. We really enjoy it. Um, Zoe and myself, we met in 2012 in college. Um, where I was finishing some agribusiness and agronomy degrees. And then we came back, we worked on the family farm with my dad. You know, for about a year, we decided to venture out and we started our own family farm back in 2015. And then a few years later, um, we just kind of grew our farm. We adopted a lot of sustainable and regenerative practices as we went, which is a big story with lots of chapters. Um, but in addition to that, we just really wanted to add some value. You know, commodity farming is very difficult. Um, but Roots Potato Chips is our own potato chip company, which we process some of our own potatoes. Um, and it's just a way for us to vertically integrate, add a little bit of value, have a market direct to consumer and through retail, which is what we have tried to do. So in a nutshell, that's where we're at today. And today, currently, we still farm. We have Roots Potato Chips and we farm in tandem with my dad quite a bit as far as operations and whatnot. Um, so it's kind of a family unit, but yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell where yeah. we're at today. And to add to that story, so we met in college and Lad was a fourth generation farmer, grew up in agriculture, but I, I went to college for nursing. I did not grow up in agriculture. I mean, I had a few family members who were farmers, so I thought I knew a little bit, but as we got married, moved to the farm, I realized I definitely knew nothing about agriculture and it's been a wild ride. I've learned so much. We kind of joke sometimes. I didn't choose the farm life. The farm life chose me. Um, but really, I would choose the farm life over and over again. I've learned so much. We've learned so much together. Um, yeah, I would choose this wild ride of a farm life over and over again and excited about our future together with the farm and Roots Potato Chips. So I see how you said that uh, he married you and then moved to the farm. See, very smart, uh, very strategic <laughs> there. Uh, had you said yes, and then you just you couldn't get out of it. See, that's uh, they yeah, just keep pulling no, you in. There was no <laughs> contractual agreement or transparency before, so we just kind of looped in there. Just surprised her. Hey, we're going to a farm. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I knew, but I okay. thought I knew what I was getting into. But until you you get into it, you you don't know what you're getting. Well, you know, it's one thing to farm uh, and, and more commodity crops. OK, so, you know, the wheat and alfalfa like you grow or or other uh, commodity uh, cash crops. And it's second, especially crops, which I, I would call potatoes, especially crop high input, high management, high costs, uh, 
you know, easy to spoil, you know, lots of ad added risk to it. So that's another level. And then uh, you just thought maybe it wasn't crazy enough and, and you're getting too much sleep. So you decided to go direct to consumer. So walk us through, uh, I think a lot of, let's say farmers in the Corn Belt hear potatoes and like, oh yeah, you know, hey, those rich potato farmers, they can just make it all happen. But in essence, it's still a commodity, isn't it? It is. When, yeah, when you're it, selling to a, a wholesaler or, or a broker, you're you're still, you know, the low guy on the totem pole. Yeah. So so usually in the U.S., there's about a million acres of potatoes. So obviously nothing compared to corn or soybeans or wheat or whatever it is, but it still is a commodity. And there are a few key buyers and there's not a lot of ways to differentiate your potatoes, just like there's not a lot of ways to differentiate your corn or your soybeans or your wheat or Milo, whatever you have. So potatoes is very much a commodity and you are it's a very volatile and fluctuating market. So every year, just like with the other commodities, there's so many variables as far as, you know, planted acreage, mother nature, externalities like exports and imports. And there's so many variables that it's a very volatile market. So um, even though it's a specialty crop, it's very similar to fluctuations just like corn and soy. So let's talk a little bit about the crop production first, and we definitely want to dive into the direct-to-consumer and, and direct to um uh, business business model you got going on um so when you think regenerative and you think potatoes uh those two words typically don't go together because they're a root crop right so sweet potatoes uh you know all of your alliums we have to dig the crop out of the ground to to harvest it and typically they they don't do so well in no-till type conditions so there, there's a lot of things you've had to do and um t tell us a little bit about why you chose to go that way because it's not easy <laughs> not a lot of people doing it and, and, and what, you, what you've kind of seen over time there in, in the production of your potatoes. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I'll take you back a little bit. So in 2012, that's, I did one of my final research papers and we did it on alternatives to chemical fumigation. So chemical fumigation in potatoes, and you're probably very familiar with it, but it's basically you come in with a synthetic chemical product and you sterilize the soil. So you're killing all microbial activity, bacterial, fungal, earthworms, macrobiology, microbiology. Um, so it's very detrimental to soil health. So in this paper, I looked for alternatives and the alternative that we looked at and there was some research available was biofumigation. So biofumigation is basically using like an oilseed radish as a cover crop or a green manure crop that you grow. Um, and then when it reaches maturity, you flail it and then you incorporate it in the soil. And as that decomposes, it releases biochemical compounds that suppress like nematodes and parasitic things like that that are bad for a potato crop. So, so that was some of like the genesis or beginning of like our interest in sustainable or and, you know, regenerative agriculture. And to your point about potatoes, so yeah, when, you know, a lot of times I think most consumers, when they hear the word regenerative, they think of big rolling green hills of pasture with cattle and all the animal integration and stuff like that. But I definitely think that regenerative, you know, people, people are always going to eat beef and they're always going to eat corn or soy or whatever it is that's mixed into their food products. They're always going to eat potatoes, root crops, whether it's onions, um, you know, Whatever it is, there's I think there's a place for regenerative agriculture and all those crops. And I think context is a huge thing because in a potato production farm versus a corn or soy farm, it's going to look a lot different. We can still apply the same regenerative principles, but it definitely looks different if you look at a potato production farm versus anything else. But I think what's important to realize is context. Context, I think, is so big in regenerative agriculture because it looks so different in Idaho than it does in the Midwest and it does in California than it does in the East Coast. Um, so context, I think, is a big, a big thing. And we've definitely learned that as we've applied a lot of those principles, you know, over the past uh, almost 10 years. Yeah, which means we've done a lot of learning along the way, too. I would say not everything we've implemented implemented has been a hundred percent success. And we've kind of just had to go for it because it's not the common route. Okay, so who's the who's the cheerleader saying let's go for it? I cheer. That's <laughs> awesome. I love it. So it, it takes. So she, is she pushing you forward? Then is what you're what you're saying? 
you know, she's great. She's really ambitious and she loves it too. Um, as far as like boots on the ground, you know, we're, we're in the middle where we have young kids too. So a lot of Zoe's time is devoted to like raising the cow and she does help out on the farm. And I know she wants to be more involved as the years go on, but she's definitely ambitious and a pusher. And but, Yeah. I'm uh, kind of the behind the scenes. Woman. You're shaking up the four generations. That's great. Yes. <laughs> fifth generation farm. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So Zoe, I want to ask you this. How excited would you be about your kids uh, wandering out in a field that's had Vapam on it versus uh, a field that's got uh, oilseed radish or mustards in it? Yeah, and we're we're definitely barefoot all the time. The kids running around. So I think yeah. there's something to be said about that, because as a farmer, I, I've eliminated seed treatments and I try to keep eliminating as many chemistries as possible, because quite frankly, I, I just don't get a joy out of it. I mean, it's, it's deadly. It causes problems. And I, I just, every time I do it, I think about it. It's like, why, why do this? Right. For sure. And, and one thing, just like you said, Moni, why, why do this? But like, I always try to be very careful because I think farming in general, farmers, however they're doing it, if they're doing it conventionally or regenerative or sustainable or organic or however they're doing, farmers are awesome. It's a super like honorable role um it's very noble i mean it's hard work so i think farmers are great just supplying food for the nation in general food fiber fuel whatever you want to call it they do such a good job so i i, I never want to put myself in a situation where i say hey i'm doing it better than this potato farmer or something like that because i think they're all great doing wonderful things but i think the key is um I think we've realized there's potential to work a little more with mother nature and rely less on chemicals and synthetic inputs. And that's really the direction we want to go. Not that everybody has to go that way. It'd be great if a lot of people did. Um, but farming is noble. It's an awesome profession. They all do a great job. We just see an opportunity, I think, to do it maybe a little bit differently. And if people want to follow along or, or work together, collaborate, more power to them. Very well said. I, um, I appreciate that. Now on your, so we realize no till is not really an option, but you've taken several steps to minimize the tillage that you do in your production. You've also done the soil health principle of diversity. You have extended rotations. I mean, there's a lot of places where it's potato, 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 you know, continuously. And then we wonder why we have these issues with phytophthora and fusarium and pythium and you know, all, all the ems right? uh, so uh just like hmm, i had five years of potatoes in a row don't know why i got disease but uh um tell us some of those other uh soil health principles that the two of you are are doing on your farm uh to to better align with nature yeah you bet so um yeah so about 10 years so we've ran we've kind of implemented a lot of these regenerative practices before we call them regenerative um, over the past 10 years. And we've just kind of done it step by step. And like Zoe said, we'll see what works. We can, we can adopt or change or, or do things differently if we need to. Uh, um, but a few of the key things that I'll, I'll tell you that we do that might be some differences is like you mentioned, tillage, so disturbance of the soil, so we've reduced our tillage by about 75 to 80% of wow. normal conventional potato production. Uh, so we, we've taken significant strides to reduce that and find a system that works. And part of that, I think, is due to our high amount of diversity and cover cropping and stuff like that. So, for example, um, the year prior to potatoes, we're putting in a 12 or 14 species cover crop mix. We got a lot of, um, you know, radishes or turnips or um buckwheat are just lots of different crops that have big diverse root systems deep root systems tap roots that are helping penetrate some of that compaction so i think that's one of the keys to eliminating um some of those needs for tillage so eliminating tillage diversity like i mentioned uh we got we we've got you know in a in a 12 year or excuse me 12 year <laughs> in a 12 month period we've got potatoes Plus, you know, I mentioned 12 to 14 species of cover crops, plus companion cropping um, that we're experimenting with. So in a 12 month period, we might be seeing, you know, 12 to 15 species of roots in the ground versus one or two in a conventional rotation, which might be seeing wheat and potatoes or something like that. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, incorporating animals too. So like, for example, 
We have our cover crop mix just prior to maturity or at maturity. We put cattle or sheep or some kind of ruminants out there that will have animal impact and they can start the biological um, decomposition product process and help stimulate um, the microbiology in the soil and all that stuff. And we've seen a benefit with that as well. Most conventional rotations, they don't ever see animals. That's just not part of the rotation. And, and that's and that's okay. That's how, that's kind of how it's been, but we've seen advantages with it. Um, let's see, what are we missing? Pollinator strip. Pollinator strip. So we've, we've uh, gotten away from pesticides, insecticides, whatever you want to call them, through companion cropping and pollinator strips. So like potatoes, they're not dependent on pollinators um, as a crop itself. But for example, we're, we're putting in these pollinator strips because we're trying to attract beneficial predatory insects like lace wings, ladybugs. Um, yeah, it, it, in addition to that, we get lots of bees and other pollinators too, which is good, I guess you could say for the ecosystem in general. But we're trying to attract these beneficial predatory insects so we don't have psyllids and aphids and stuff that are detrimental to our potato crops. Um, so that's one thing. And then we're also relying a lot on biological inputs, composting, stuff like that, and um, you know, green manure, cover crops, things as well. And then in addition to that, um, we're you know, we're keeping the, the soil covered in that 12-month period for 80 to 90 percent of the year as well as having living root systems in the ground where a traditional potato operation might only have roots in the ground three to four months out of the year. So those are a couple of the key, key differentiators. Yeah. Anything else that I missed? You covered it. Great. The Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. The ASN team is hands-on, digging in and invested in regenerative agriculture, along with the proper plant nutrition and biologicals to boost your soil microbiome. We provide the ideas and implementation guidance to support you on your soil health journey. So stop farming the same way and contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. And you make your own compost on site, so not just buying it in. Um, I saw some videos that you're doing compost, so. We do buy some, um, okay. but we do make some on site. Yeah. Sure. sure. I like the idea as a pollinator. You have another enterprise opportunity with one of the kids. Uh, do beekeeping on the on the pollinator strips. So <laughs> look out. That'll be, uh, you have honey flavored uh, potato chips. That'll be uh, the next thing. You can raise your own honey for the potato chips. There you go. Love it. I like it. You're, 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 uh, well, let's talk about that. I think once you kind of open your mind to these soil health principles and you get down that road, does is it just me, Zoe, or is it kind of change how your brain is wired and you start looking at all these other opportunities of other enterprises or other ways to to utilize the land? Is that is that a fair way to say that? Yeah, for sure. I see that. Um, we just there's just more opportunities for growth and and that, yeah. does that make it boring or or more interesting what do you more think more interesting like Less we'll sleep even, but yeah, um, more I interesting. Find entertain we'll go out and do like worm counts and that just kind of a marker of soil health we're looking at worms with the kids and it just kind of opens your view the focus on the soil health the microbiome in the soil and it's fascinating to me and don't you think one of the problems we have is keeping kids in the farm, uh, you know, the next generation, because it just, you can lack interest. And when you create opportunities like this with your regenerative farming practices, now we can say regen and feel cool about ourselves, right? Uh, but the soil health focused farming practices, you can do that. You can go out and look at the beneficial bugs. You can look at the earthworms and it gets them from a young age, um, creating wonder and, and excitement to be involved in the farm. Yeah. And I definitely see that. I mean, our kids really love tractors <laughs> right now, <laughs> seven, but they do, they find an interest in the, the farm and there's so much to teach them when they're out there. Yeah. So we got all these great things going on and congratulations for reducing your tillage 75 to 80%. That is, that is huge. Uh, that is absolutely amazing. Uh, so California farmers, listen to this, see you, he's thrown down the challenge. Uh, you tomato guys, you have no excuse compared to, to a potato guy. Okay. So, um, you know, really look at how you can reduce your tillage. 
One other thing I want to ask you is what have you noticed? You mentioned that you've nearly eliminated insecticides because your pollinator strips, but also has to do with that tillage too. What are you noticing in the fungicide applications? Because, you know, potatoes uh, are, are um, a pretty fungicide dependent crop a lot of times. Uh, have you noticed or be able to reduce uh, the amount that you put out in that regard? For sure, yeah. So we don't use any synthetic products, um, chemicals, uh, or uh, hold it. You can't. No, no, no. You can't put, grow potatoes like that. Didn't anybody tell you you're supposed to support the big three chem companies? Come on. Yeah, we don't yeah, use watch synthetic herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, um, any of those. And I think a lot goes down to like where we're trying to really focus on soil health and plant health. Obviously, you know, most people I think are starting to understand this better, but when the plant can have some self-defense mechanisms from being healthier and being able to be more resilient and stuff to drought or insects or whatever that is, um, it's just a huge thing. And then a, a lot of farmers, and I'm sure this is the same across all commodities, but they do a lot of preventative applications versus needed applications. Um, and so I, I think already a lot of people could probably do some applications. But then in addition to that, like we're we're trying to do bricks testing and stuff. So we're really trying to see how healthy our plant is, what stage it's at, if, 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 what we could do if we need to add a foliar biological spray or something to stimulate the plant to help it defend pests. Um, you know, whether that's a fungus, <laughs> whether that's a fungus or a bug or whatever it is. But no, so we don't we don't use any of those um on our potatoes and that's kind of the direction we've been headed and i think there's six that that's our baby in the back oh that's so, fine but uh, what yeah. this tells me uh here lad is with all of uh the lack of input purchasing it tells me that you you probably have to buy your own ball caps uh you, you probably don't probably don't uh, shirts. yeah you have to buy your own shirts your own sweatshirts uh and your own hats uh so yeah. I have plenty of hats. <laughs> Monty, I think you hit the nail, you hit the nail on the head right there with the hammer too. So I think the biggest thing I think for me, it's so fun to talk about like soil health and certain practices that we're implementing and stuff like that. But the biggest thing, the thing that I think is most attractive to farmers is to know that, hey, this is an opportunity to be more profitable at my bottom line. It's not so much that I'm focusing on soil health or whatnot, but if I do focus on soil health. In the end, it's going to have a greater ROI than my current production system or bottle. And so I, I think that's the biggest way to draw in farmers and stuff is to show them that, hey, you can eliminate these. You can still maintain yields and quality. And at the end of the day, you're going to be more profitable, which I think that's that's big. So And more in control of your own destiny. More uh, in control. You're going to rely less on external inputs. Good or bad. I mean, it can go both ways, right? You can, I've screwed up royally. You probably haven't, but I have. Uh, I mean, you can, you can do it both ways. Oh yeah. No, we've screwed up. I mean, just doing this too, we've done a few things that haven't worked, whether that's been, you know, fertility or for example, we experiment a lot with companion cropping. So we're looking at, you know, more of polyculture systems. And we've done that for about five years, but we haven't found something that worked quite right. And for example, we tried this mix last year. We saw a reduction in yield of about 30% on five acres. So it wasn't big, um, but it was still fairly significant. So we definitely made some hiccups, but that's part of the learning process. But you learned what doesn't work. So that's good. Right. It's just as important as learning what does. All right. I want to jump into the tater chips here. Uh, Roots chips. How did this come about? And and who had the idea? Hey, let's let's instead of sell these potatoes we're raising by the twenty five to forty ton truckload, uh, <laughs> let's sell them by eight ounce bag uh, or one or whatever size that you have there. Uh, talk talk about that and and how that all got its start. Okay, so the credit really goes to the Lad. It was his dream his idea to start this potato chip company and to be honest i kind of thought it was a little bit crazy to start i mean i had no background or knowledge in starting food production but we kind of dove in together we we built it upon some of our like passions we we really love snacking in our home but we're really particular about the ingredients we want better for ingredients we don't want 
artificial dyes. We want healthy oils. We're also really passionate about farming as we've talked about today. And we wanted to provide this potato chip. We want it to be fresh from the farm. We want it to have healthy ingredients, healthy oils. Um, and that's really what Roots Chips is. We built it upon those desires of ours and it, it was a hard journey to get where we are and we have more growing to do. Um, but uh, I think to that. Yeah, and just to echo what she said, you know, a lot of it stemmed from the desire to get out of commodity agriculture and to add value or vertically integrate. And you see more and more of that. A lot of family farms, whether that's cow, whether that's beef or poultry or whatever it is, or other products, they're trying to go direct to consumer, direct to market. Because I think there's an opportunity like that that there has never been before, at least that I'm not aware of. Um, so yeah, I, a lot of it was, hey, let's, how do we get out of this volatile commodity system and how do we have more controls on pricing and our product and take advantage of some of the things that we're implementing in our farm? Yeah, you're doing the frying and, and uh, bagging and everything on farm. So, right, this is not like a co-packer where you're like, hey, I got some potatoes, you know, make me an artsy fartsy uh, label, stick my name on it and give me a couple pennies. You're, you're, you have the equipment, you have the people, you did the recipes, you uh, yeah, really yeah, walk through all of this. I mean, there's, there's farmers just don't know what this takes, you know, just see like, Oh, wow. Ding, 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 you know, pull the lever and all the money starts flowing. Right. It, it's not like that. So walk us through that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, there's, this is, this was quite the process and I wasn't very familiar experience with CPG. So, and you're right, you probably know what CPG is, but CPG is a consumer package good. Um, so basically it's all the food products and stuff you can find in the store, but I didn't know what CPG stood for when we started this. I didn't know yeah. a lot of stuff, most stuff I didn't know, but. Probably our, good you didn't, stuff. right? <laughs> yeah. If you would have known, you would have, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> we never would have started money. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's okay. You got uh, tell us about your your CPG. See, we all learned a new TLA today. Uh, <laughs> TLA is a three letter acronym. So, okay, uh, CPG. So, yeah, when we decided to start it, we had to do all our due diligence and research, and so we tried to you know network with a few people that could kind of point us in the right direction and whatnot. We took some food processing courses so we could figure out all the legality and stuff as far as um, you know, right. registered with the FDA and having a food food safety audits and being approved and nutritional labels, all the back end stuff. There is so much back end stuff that I just didn't know. So if if farmers ever want to go direct to consumer, retail, or create a good, there's a lot of back end stuff, but there's a lot of resources too that you can use now to help you. But make sure you do your research because I just I had no idea it was as much as it was. So. That's kind of how it started. Um, we formulated our seasonings. Um, we came up with a recipe. Um, we put together a small facility. So we have our own manufacturing equipment, packaging equipment and stuff like that. Um, we have completed three years. We're in our fourth year. But that first year, you know, we, we started to create some product. It was kind of trial and error. We got a little better as we went. Um, but we, we started out with some local retailers and online and stuff like that and very small. And then, you know, our we, uh, we've we grown about 300% year over year for the first three years and our facility is currently max capacity. So we can't, we can't do any more. And we have um, quite a few requests actually from retailers and distributors to grow. And so we're kind of in the middle of that expansionary phase where we're looking at expanding our building or putting together a new processing facility or bringing in a partner or something like that. Um, but currently we sell, uh, we're, we're very local and regional. So we sell pretty much 80 to 90% of our product in Idaho, Montana, Utah, Wyoming. We do a lot in retailers, independent retailers, co-ops. We do a couple select stores of big, you know, box stores like, you know, Walmart, Whole Foods, Kroger, uh, Albertsons as well. And then we do a lot of food service. So there's been a good opportunity. People love to connect to agriculture. So that's what's very unique about our potato chip. It's very transparent um, and it's traceable too. So people can connect directly to the farm. They understand how the potatoes are grown. There's just 100% trace or transparency versus the others 
where people just know, I have no idea where this potato came from. I don't know what kind of growing practices it was grown, but the food service side has been very beneficial because, you know, a lot of the restaurants, they want to have more traceable products where they can connect it to a farmer or a consumer. So we've seen great growth there. Um, and then, um, yeah, and, and and like I mentioned, we're kind of expanding right now. So we're yeah. just looking for opportunities to to grow as we get more production. Capacity. Yeah, we're also available online. We have yeah. our website. And just to give you kind of a picture of what formulating our chips looked like, it looked like testing different flavors every night. We were eating potato chips, trying. We were really particular. We wanted, like I said, we wanted to use good for you, natural ingredients, but we wanted it to get taste a, good. Get a countertop fryer. Yes. <laughs> Every night. Um, and I honestly wasn't a potato chip eater before. And I love our potato chips. I'm really proud of even like the texture, the thickness. We are just particular about developing it. And we want it to be perfect potato chip. And yeah. Now you got to save that fryer for the future uh, museum. Okay, don't don't, yeah. don't get rid of that first fryer. You can you know put it in a little shrine with spotlights on it. So, yeah. but okay, so little per, what percent of your potatoes that you're growing today are going into, uh, into the potato chips themselves? So it's pretty minimal. It's about ten right. percent. Oh wow, that's quite a bit actually. I, I figured in. Yeah, that's amazing. But we do have some, yeah, plans to expand that and whatnot. Sure. But the you know, limiting factor is production. Ask. Have you found that the, the potato that you need to sell wholesale is a different grade type or quality than the potato you need for your potato chips to where this allows you to take 10% of your stream off for your potato chips and, and have a, I imagine it's a different shape, size, color, uh, and the wholesale to where you're actually gaining some advantages in, in both by, by separating those streams. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's definitely an advantage. We we haven't necessarily been able to separate streams because, for example, the potatoes that we raise for roots, potato chips are a different variety of potato than the ones that go to like retail and stuff like that. Um, on occasion, we do use those if we need to, but for the most part, they're separate. Uh, but it definitely has been a big advantage to vertically integrate a, a little bit, you know, um, we're definitely on the path to where we want this to be as far as growth and whatnot. But I think there's definitely an advantage to us as farmers to have a home and a premium home that will give us a premium price because we have, you know, potatoes that are certified regenerative or more nutrient dense or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. in the long term. So I think there'll be great advantages to, to having that vertical integration in the future. And then where are you at on the output side, as far as wholesale to uh, consumer, uh, ratio. Uh, most of your business sounds like it's going to grocery and, and, uh, and such. Yeah. So direct to consumer, I think we're like two or 3% or something. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Is that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a hard product to, you know, uh, uh, ship across the country. Right. So it's yeah, uh, you're shipping it, a lot of air and a few yeah. chips. Exactly. Is our online, we usually have limited inventory because most of our stuff is going to distributors and stuff most of the time, but um, we've seen a big demand for it. So that's why I think there's so much opportunity for farmers if they want to create some sort of product, food product to market direct to consumer, because I think we could sell a lot more, but we're just always sold out online because we don't have a ton of inventory and whatever we do online usually sells out quickly. But just, I mean, the most common questions we get is, you know, tell us about your farm. Do you use pesticides? Are you non-GMO? Are you, um, you just similar questions like that that have to do with like sustainability and farm type things. So if any farmer has that traceability and transparency opportunity to go direct to consumer, consumers seem to really Yeah, they're looking like for it. those niche products. Right. And yeah. And then the number one question we're getting lately on our direct to consumer business is, and others are, is, are you real? I mean, are you getting that <laughs> now, Zoe? I mean, people, people wonder because there's so much greenwashing out there of, you know, uh, uh, happening by the big corporations. Have you seen any of that feedback? No, I think a big part of the reason we're not getting that question is um, we're kind of putting ourselves out there and sharing our story. We're really big on social media. 
Um, it's you in front of the camera and, yeah. and in the field and such. It's in the videos, it's our farm, it's our product. People are able to feel like they're connecting, taking a step onto our farm and then buying that product. Straight so uh, other farmers who are considering doing a direct to consumer, whether it's flour, whether it's meat or potato chips or almonds, what, whatever you're considering doing, you need to be the story, right? You need to be out there. People need to, they want to connect with, with you personally. Yeah, I, I think so. That's my opinion. Yeah. And then but it's also on social media, it's kind of a free advertisement, a way to connect with people. Um, yeah. And tell your story. But yeah. And I think it's interesting too, Moni, is because I li I listened to a recent podcast on the New Hope Network. The New Hope Network, they do a lot of consumer studies and stuff like that, consumer trends and whatnot. But what they found was that Gen Z, a lot of their buying habits are based on real people and transparency, not so much on like certifications of a product or whatnot. So like I'm, I'm a millennial and I think millennials might tend to end, you know, before boomer or whoever it is, they might tend to rely more on product certifications and stuff to understand a product. But like the up and coming generation, Gen Z, which will soon have a lot more buying power as the years go on, they want to know more about the story. They want to know more about the product, where it came from, the people that produced it. And from doing that, they can understand about the qualities of the product versus just certifications. So I think moving forward, having that transparency traceability aspect is going to be very big. In the past, we relied on those labels to assert trust. You know, yep. that's what you were doing when you got certified organic or if you got certified regenerative or you got certified whatever. Uh, it was a way to purchase uh, a proven and purchase and display a trust. And I think there's been so much, you know, free range chicken and antibiotic free chicken and, and you know, non-GMO lettuce that uh, all three of those, by the way, folks, are a joke that I just said. Uh, I mean, people just don't trust the labels anymore. So having that relationship, and, and I think that's key. If you're considering doing this yourself, you have to be willing to put yourself in front of that camera and, and out and available to people. And I think a lot of times for farmers, that's tough, isn't it? We just want to drive the tractors and, and have fun and, and, and grow things, right? You know, but to be out there, it's it's tough, isn't it? And Zoe could tell you a little bit more about our social media initiative. We don't have a huge following, but we're steadily growing it. And sometimes I'm not comfortable always doing that social media stuff. I don't always love to do it, especially so if it involves like, a, so good like a dance <laughs> or something like that. But um, uh, we've we've grown to like it a little bit more as we go. But Zoe's helped push that for sure. Yeah. So you're part of the 300% uh, percent growth problem, I, I understand then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So one of the things really important to you is uh, giving back. Uh, you decided early on to give a portion of, of what your sales are to food banks and, and people who are in hunger. Talk, talk to us about that, why it's important to you and, and um, what all that's, uh, what impact that's made. Purpose. Yeah. So our mission statement is um, potatoes with a purpose and um, it's for the snacker for the earth and for the soil and for the earth and um for the snacker it's everyone out there eating chips who want to provide like we said quality potato chips from our farm good for you ingredients full of flavor and then we have um for the soil which talks about soil health farm. and regenerative farming and all our practices there and then for the earth or the planet we um, talk about ecosystems and you could probably talk more about the sustainable. Yeah. It, yeah. Just like Zoe said, and um, that's kind of our threefold mission is, you know, a better product for the consumer, a better product, a more sustainable product that was grown from the soil and then for the planet. So we like, we're a plastic neutral product and we try to, we use the whole potato. So they call it skin on potato. And a lot of big processors are peeling the potato and you that's, lose some nutrients. That's where the nutrients add in. <laughs> you lose some nutrients and you create more waste as well. So that's part of us being more um, sustainable for the planet as well. Um, and in addition to that, we also use some, you could even call them upcycled potatoes, is we're not maybe 
always as picky as true because a, a lot of potatoes are just fine. They might have a little black spot or brown spot on them or a little bruise, but they're great chips. Why discard them if it's just going to contribute to waste? So there's quite a few different things that we do. And then we want to we definitely want to support our communities as well. And in the past, um, we have donated to food banks and things like that, as well as um, we, we get lots of requests from FFA groups and other things like that, schools and public schools to make donations as well. So that's kind of our threefold approach. Well, that's awesome. So your max capacity, um, I'm assuming to take that next step up, that's a big price tag. How do you how do you go about uh, doing that? Where well, how what goes into that decision for you guys? We're dreaming big. <laughs> I always say we're working hard and dreaming hard. Um, I don't know, lads, working on it. Yeah, yeah, we definitely got big dreams and aspirations of what we want it to be. And at the end of the day, we don't want it just to be a. We really want to scale this significantly, but we don't want it just to be a beneficial thing for us. We really want it to be more of a cooperative or collaborative benefit. So we want to get to the point where um, we're able to source from neighboring farms, too, and maybe help them implement some regenerative practices and stuff like that to have an additional outlet for potatoes. Because right now, like like I mentioned, commodity potato farming you either can sell to retail to the fresh market or there's big three processors, French fry processors that make all the fries for McDonald's and Arby's and all your fast food places and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there, you're very limited on outlets and there's not a lot of initiatives or, or price incentives for farmers to do regenerative agriculture, sustainable or soil health practices and stuff like that. So we really want to get this to a point where it's beneficial for us and for the community at large as well. So like you mentioned, um, we've we've priced quite a few things and it's pretty significant when you get into larger size expansions and, and processing equipment and facilities and all the infrastructure that's involved there. So it's probably a little more than we can chew. Um, so currently we're we're looking at a few strategic partners that could help us scale and help us with some capital needs and whatnot to, to get to where we think this can be. Um, but it's kind of on the horizon right now and we're just exploring a few opportunities, but that's really where we want it to get to. And I think like, you know, uh, you mentioned this earlier, Monty, but when you start meddling with stuff, your entrepreneurial spirit just keeps going and going and going. So you think, okay, well, if we get this, what, what other, farm to pouch products can we do you know whether that's well there's a few things that we've that we've thought of that we could also source from our own farm and source from neighboring farms but um, there's lots of value for these farmers to be part part of the whole supply chain instead of just growers so there's um would you hope that some of your funding will come from those neighboring farms that you hope to partner with i mean that way the you know they're they're invested right they're invested in the process they're invested in the in the in the growing portion or will you have to go outside you think for for most of your um, uh, capital need you know we we definitely consider that and i think it is still an option um to be able to source or pool a group of farmers because then they're they are invested but some of the stuff that we're doing is quite different than a lot of other farmers and so i just don't know if they see um eye to eye with what we're trying to do so i could i could see some some roadblocks there as far as getting that done so currently we're looking with you know outside partners more so groups you know whether that's investment groups or family offices or private equity that are interested in scaling regenerative supply chains so the whole thing from grower to the consumer with processing in between. So that that's what we're gonna explore right now for the time being. And if that doesn't work out, we might do an alternative route. So um I I hope that hope that works for you. It's neat to see um uh, <laughs> a friend of mine one time said, uh, do you ever feel like you're the dog that was chasing and finally caught the bus? And <laughs> then you're wondering, what do I do with the bus? Right. <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else is on the horizon for you guys if this is not enough? Really? I hope it's enough. <laughs> well, raising raising these little guys and 
you what know, we got, wait, is that mom. number three or number four there? Four. She's our only girl. Oh my. Hi. Look at that <laughs> smile. Yeah, you got to definitely turn into YouTube for that. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, that is awesome. So we got the girl or oh, you're, and you're the youngest. You're going to definitely be spoiled there. Little girl. So She's got three older brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Three protectors. That's awesome. <laughs> um, Monty, I think that's a big part of what we want to do too is, you know, it, like you, you mentioned, if you add different enterprises to your farm or add value or vertically integrate, you get more opportunities for kids to return to the farm. The next generation. Maybe they're not necessarily interested in production agriculture, but they might be interested in, in help manufacturing the farm value added product or, or whatever it is. And so that's really what we'd like to do for our kids too. If, if they want to, and if they're excited about it, they have a passion for it, we'd love for them to return. And if they don't, then more power to them to do what they want. Right. And if you think folks, um, you just increase your odds, right? Because, you know, if you're just, a, just driving tractors, that's a, that's a very narrow thing. But if you're, you know, like you said, the whole production process, then there's a whole marketing process, sales and marketing. There's, you know, logistics and all these different areas of interest uh, that family members can be involved. So I, I think about that on our farm. If we were just yeah. corn soybean, you know, of all our grandchildren, there'd be not many people interested in that. In fact, none. But because of the livestock and the direct consumer, uh, you know, we currently have four of our grandkids working this summer in various ways uh, at the farm. So that's pretty exciting. So that's awesome. Yeah, that is, I love that. What else should we have talked about in our time together here today, gang? Hmm. Well, um, yeah. I, go ahead. Yeah. Just make, make sure to connect with us on on our social media outlets. We're on Instagram mostly oh. and some other places. Yeah. And we'd love to connect with everyone and share more of our story. Yep. And rootschips.com is the website for your potato chip business, correct? Yes. And, you can, and then from there, you can find their social media and, and follow them on there and see what they're doing. It's really creative, uh, artful, and um, and definitely tells a story very, very well. I uh, want to congratulate you on what you've done to really pioneer in your area, those uh, soil health techniques. Uh, I bet you've crossed paths with Brendan Rocky and Jay Fuhrer once or twice to to do those kind of things and you know and you're making it happen there local uh that's that's great to see and then taking it that next level providing you know healthy choice uh you know uh, snacks uh that when we used to make them you know a long time ago we made them out of basic ingredients you know lard which isn't bad for you despite what you said and potato chips and salt i mean that was the ingredients and then we came to cottonseed oil and msg and you know, who knows what else in there? How do we take these wrong turns? And it's, uh, it's great to see you guys bringing it back to, uh, food instead of filler. And, uh, um, I'm glad to see that. And I wish you and your, your family great success and, and God's timing that your, your expanded production process, uh, comes together the way it's supposed to. Thanks, Monty. We appreciate you having us on. I, I got to so warn you, I want to come and visit you sometime. I, I have a trip scheduled up to Idaho, so I, I might uh, pull in the driveway sometime. You can put me to work. Hey, we, we love that. <laughs> I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Nice to visit with you guys. I wish you all the best, Lad and Zoe, and uh, your family as they continue to grow and, and uh, become a vital part of uh, food in this country. Well, thanks for joining us today as we explored Lad and Zoe's journey of farming and growing great potatoes that they use in their operation, Roots Potato Chips. It's inspiring to hear how Lad and Zoe are not only growing their farm, but also working to improve soil health and bring you a better for you snack to the market. And if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help growers adopt effective soil health practices, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening. <laughs>